Uh, recording. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for the Open Pedagogy webinar series. This is the first in the series of webinars that will be happening from now until the end of April. Um, this is our open introduction to Open Pedagogy. And for those of you uh, who know Robin and Rajiv, you know that we have the two stars to start us off and we wanted to thank them very much for their time. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background on the webinar series and then we'll turn this right over to Robin and Rajiv. Um, my name is Mary Lou Forward. I work for the SUNY system. SUNY is the largest uh, comprehensive system of higher education in the United States. Um, I'll come back to the webinar schedule in just a second. We have campuses across the state of New York, which include community colleges up to doctoral and uh, degree granting institutions. We have about 500,000 students a year. And this webinar series is a combination, it's a collaboration between the SUNY FAC2 Council, which is the Faculty Advisory Council on Teaching and Technology. Um, in, the, uh, in that council is a group focused on uh, open education initiatives. And this year, we are focusing on open pedagogy for that task group. And so we have collaborated with the Open Education Consortium to put on the webinar series about open pedagogy. Let me turn that over to Susan to introduce OEC. Hi everyone, Susan Huggins here from Open Education Consortium. We are so excited to co-host this webinar series with SUNY and really excited to kick it off with, uh, I agree with Mary Lou, the two most excitable people I know um, when it comes to open pedagogy. Uh, we are the global um, open education consortium. We are a global nonprofit uh, literally based all over the world and have over 240 members from 44 countries. Some of the activities we are involved in, uh, next slide, there you go. Um, we sponsor a, uh, a global uh, conference every year. This year it will be in November in Milan. We also host Open Education Week, which is coming up in only a couple of weeks and encourage everyone to go to our uh, website and check it out. And uh, a few of our other regional activities include CCC OER and a brand new one we are actually kicking off next week, uh, our Latin America regional uh, group. Uh, and at this point, I'll turn it over to you guys. Actually, let's just go give the schedule quickly for uh, okay. other webinars. If you are interested in hearing examples of open pedagogy after this webinar today, we have a lot coming up for Open Education Week, so please sign up for those. And then we continue on with our series, which will conclude with a panel from students giving student perspectives on open pedagogy, and finally, a panel on removing barriers. So without any further ado, let's turn this over to uh, to Rajiv and to Robin. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I, it's a thrill to, to be here, and I'm so grateful to both the OEC and SUNY, who are both just incredible leaders within the open education movement for hosting this series of webinars and for inviting Robin and me uh, to help kick things off. Uh, of course, I'm endlessly uh, grateful uh, to co be able to collaborate with, with Robin. And as I load up our slides, I'm going to ask Robin to just say a couple of words to introduce herself. Hello, everybody from New Hampshire in the US, and I am um, the director of the newly emerging uh, Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative at Plymouth State University. And I also wanted to let you know before Rajiv kicks it off that the slide deck for this presentation will tweet out from my account um, in about 45 minutes. I'll also retweet that uh, to the open pedagogy hashtag that we're using and you'll find it all sorts of places. But it's of course openly licensed and you're more than welcome to borrow from it as much as you find useful. Wonderful. Um, and um, as, uh, as, you, as you may have read, uh, I work at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, which is a public post-secondary institution in the Vancouver area in British Columbia, uh, where I'm a psychology instructor by trade uh, and recently, more, uh, more recently, serving as special advisor to the provost on open education, a role that I hope will emerge at more and more institutions. Um, so really to kick things off, we'd like to begin just by talking about a broader context. 
And I think even though many of us have been working within education, perhaps even post-secondary education for a while, uh, it sometimes still strikes many of my colleagues by surprise when they learn about Article 26 in the UN uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which talks about how everyone has the right uh, to access education and how equitable access to education is a goal. And I think even when we learn about this, our minds immediately perhaps go to the third world. I grew up in India, and that's a good context where you can point to, for example, way more students than the number of seats, insufficient infrastructure. And I think those are the sorts of contexts that come to mind when we talk about something like this. But I think it's important to acknowledge um, that this applies equally in North America, um, and certainly even in 2019. Uh, just quick snapshots. Roughly two thirds of US undergraduates require a student loan to meet us in the classroom, right? Average student loan debt, just on average at this point, is hovering around $30,000. And just this last year, um, the nation hit a, a really horrifying uh, landmark, or past one anyway, in terms of more than $1.5 trillion in student loan debt having been crossed in the country. So these are serious issues of access. Uh, and of course, these speak to many, many different things. In some cases, the gradual defunding of public higher ed across your country and mine as well, uh, in many cases, uh, but also things like the cost of living. And in the midst of all of this, there is another uh, problem that's emerged that's quite serious. And of course, that's one of the areas that the open education movement uh, has really attached itself to. Robin, is your mic working? It's working, but I had oh, you on that one. But oh, sorry, that, all good. That could, that could be that could just be this our first back of many problems. <laughs> exactly. So the textbooks are broke, but the mics are working. So that's good. <laughs> Um, but this is a serious issue. I think there's a couple of reasons why the open ed movement has focused on textbooks, even though it seems like a really mundane uh, issue to, to, to grapple with. Uh, one is, is that there's actually no other consumer good which has risen in cost as much as textbooks have. Uh, the BLS began collecting data on this in, in 1977, and between then and 2016, it had risen more than 1,000% in cost fairly typically between three and four times the rate of inflation. Um, Jonathan Poritz at the University of Colorado at Pueblo has, has done some wonderful work in which he's essentially flipped this around to show that, for example, if you were a student in the 1980s, uh, the, the amount that you would have had to spend today is more than two and a half times or three times the rate that you would have had to spend back then. So this is a serious issue. It is one that affects students tangibly, um, and it's not one that they can easily uh, budget for. It's often the one that hits them as a surprise out of the gate. Yeah, and that uh, brings us to this really interesting study that I would like to point out, um, which was actually by a, a bookstore um, uh, organization, that students worry more about paying for books than they worry about paying for college, which is probably partially, as Rajiv just said, the lack of a plan for unexpected last minute costs, which of course leads to credit card debt when students are lucky enough actually to uh, have credit cards that they're able to use, um, or it can lead to students not purchasing the book at all. And this really surprises no faculty when I show this slide from the Florida Virtual Campus Study. Uh, this study was done both in 2012 and again in 2016. So we've got really quite a, a bit of, of data that shows the effect of high textbook costs on student success and student learning. And I really think as a faculty member, this is where I started understanding that the textbook cost question was not actually about the high cost of textbooks. It was about whether or not my students were going to have access to their educations, whether they were going to be able to, uh, to come to college, to enroll, to complete their courses, and ultimately to complete their degrees. So you can see here the very high numbers of percentages of students who are dropping courses, withdrawing from courses, failing courses, um, specifically because they report they can't afford the cost of learning materials. And that's where the, the whole thing becomes, I think, a social justice issue related to some of that um, UN stuff that Rajiv was talking about at the top of the webinar. And of course, unlike most things in higher education, it's sort of phenomenally amazing that we have at least somewhat of a solution to the problem of high textbook costs. Um, certainly when we're talking about community colleges or introductory courses, we've got a full slate of openly licensed textbooks 
uh, ready to go. These are examples from, from OpenStax. Um, we know all of the data at this point that uh, we won't talk about so much in this webinar uh, about the perception studies that show faculty and students both rating the, the quality of these materials as, as high. Uh, so we know we can make a real difference in textbook cost uh, issues, but this is really not about saving money as much as it is about access to knowledge. So if I said to you, hey, I got some cool ways we can lower costs in higher ed, most of us would immediately shrink back in fear knowing that the list of things that was about to be <laughs> told to us were not going to be things that were gonna be good for student learning. What, we, what we're not interested in is lowering costs that don't actually improve access to knowledge and the learning experience. So what we're gonna talk about now is how this movement to OER can not only increase access to knowledge, but can also enhance learning. of social justice but that is not not uh, research that looks at the impact on educational 25 published studies so far and if you're interested in looking at the research I, I encourage you to visit the website of the open education group it's just openedgroup.org where you'll see summaries and in fact uh, open access articles of many of this work uh, much of this work uh, this is an interesting one because this talks about the sequence of what is the impact of assigning OER on student enrollment on student persistence on student performance and then student completion and all the way through where they are talking about uh, courses that are taught face-to-face -face or, or online in this particular case at Tidewater Community College, uh, you're seeing gains. Um, and of course, the gains are across the board in many ways, uh, trying to at least disabuse people of the notion that, uh, that OER might do some harm, far from it. But it's not just that OER does good and, and positively impacts outcomes, uh, but uh, another bit of research over here, this out of the University of Georgia system last year, uh, points to how just as the burden of uh, textbook costs disproportionately impact students who are already marginalized. When you assign OER, of course, the benefits of OER, uh, not just in terms of cost savings, but in terms of educational outcomes, disproportionately accrue in favor of those same marginalized groups, which is, of course, something that, again, reinforces this notion that this may seem like a discussion about textbooks and pages and money and cost savings, but it's much, much deeper. Uh, and it's easy as a faculty member to overlook the deeper implications, the social justice implications of something like this. As faculty members, we are often unaware, sometimes shockingly, of the cost of the resources that we assign to our students. We assume that all of our students are able to afford and access those resources, which is why we sometimes tie uh, critical elements of coursework, such as homework, uh, to access codes. But I think this kind of research really helps shed light on the power of, of thinking about these and interrogating those decisions, uh, and, and of course, seeing the benefits that flow from that interrogation. And I'll, I'll try not to make a, a sarcastic crack about access codes while I have this access slide on. Uh, so instead, I'll just say that when you switch from talking about cost savings to access, a lot of other domains open up, or at least they did for me, um, starting to think about access broadly writ. So if I care about textbook costs as an academic issue, right, my students can't academically succeed if they can't afford the learning materials, then I should probably also care about whether they can afford the gas to get to my class, for example, or the wireless or broadband access to access their online courses at home. Um, I might start caring about what it's like for a single parent to try to schedule their classes or think about uh, food pantries on my campus and how those can uh, help food insecure students get the nourishment they need to be able to come to the table to learn. So for me, there's a real shift there in thinking about one specific uh, cost saving metric and instead a new orientation to academia as something that is intrinsically related to access, that our students won't be able to come into knowledge if they're not able uh, to deal with all of the things that might make it difficult for them to learn. This also, for me, helps me think about accessibility and if we're building new kinds of materials, what do we need to do to make them accessible to the, uh, to the widest uh, number of learners that are possible? And that's why I think you hear lots of people in open 
uh, interested in accessible design and uh, the user experience with the with the materials. Um, I think yeah, you're. Oh yeah, access to knowledge creation. It's right here in front of me, my friends. So th the transition here from access to knowledge to access to knowledge creation is kind of where the magic happens. If we imagine that to build equitable ecosystems for learning, that we have to take an access oriented approach, we don't just want to do that in, the, in that kind of downloading model where I hope all of the students can be here to receive the wisdom um, that we will bestow upon them but instead also to have our students participating in the creation and revision and expansion of knowledge, which really is a, a democratic project related to social justice in my mind as well. We can think about this with all of the interests that we have in labor markets right now, job training and preparing students for career and all these things that are so important. But we don't just want our students to graduate well-trained for a labor market, we also want them to be shaping the labor markets that they will be graduating into. So how can we take this commitment to access and expand it so that we also want give students access to participating in scholarly creation, not just absorbing uh, scholarly artifacts? So I'm assuming most of you are familiar at this point with Creative Commons licensing and the benefits that flow from them. But I think there's still people who, who are even are working with OER, who are assigning OER, or even practicing forms of open pedagogy, who perhaps confuse what OER actually means with things that are just free and online. When of course the key is the, the licensing itself when it comes to open educational resources. Uh, and of course the five affordances, the five permissions that flow from open licensing. Uh, so as you can see, retain, reuse, remix, uh, revise, redistribute. But just to touch on this as a faculty member for a moment, uh, retain is not something I take lightly, uh, especially when we're living in an era of, uh, you know, attempts to define by naming, by calling things inclusive access, where it's a bit like uh, our colleague uh, Nicole Allen uh, usually refers to the old Men in Black movies, where if you've had an experience, you put up that little gadget and you think, oh, you're done now, and we're going to erase that from your memory, because of course you lose access when you lease access to digital uh, uh, textbooks, for example, or access codes for that matter, that you can't resell. I, for one, would like for a student who's taking a first year course in anatomy and physiology who wants to go on to medical school to be able to act, uh, retain access to those resources uh, as a reference, not feel compelled to resell those expensive books. I really like the additional academic freedoms. So it's not just free, but it's the freedoms that flow from being able to uh, adapt, to revise, to contextualize, to localize content. I don't I'll have to tell my students don't read chapter four, take it out. If there's something that's late breaking development in my field, I can make that revision in the text midway through the semester. Uh, I can embed local examples, local statistics. Uh, we've researched that features work in, in, uh, in labs at our university through it. We scaffold my assignment through it. I can really move from bending my courses uh, around the table of contents of a textbook to modifying those resources to serve my pedagogical goals. And of course, uh, we've got the lovely hieroglyphics on the right, uh, which once you're able to decode, you're really able to, to understand what permissions you have. Uh, from the person at the top with the circle around it, simply attribution, cornerstone of academia anyway, give credit to those who've created the works. The dollar sign with the slash through it, saying that these works may be used, uh, but not for commercial purposes, uh, as much of a, uh, of a debate that continues about what commercial purposes actually entail. Um, uh, uh, right at the bottom first, I'll say the uh, symbol that actually looks like the copy left symbol, uh, which is the share alike, which is that you may reuse this in any way you like, adapt it, translate it into French, if you will, but you're going to share that resource back with the commons under an identical license. So it's not just you and your students that will benefit, it will be everyone, the wider commons. And then finally, I'll go back to number three, which was the uh, equal sign uh, in the middle of the circle, which is not even technically an open educational resource, even though it is a Creative Commons license, uh, because that uh, essentially denies you the permission to revise, to remix, to be able to create any derivative works. So you'll often see a combination of these licenses uh, in uh, all kinds of open ed resources, whether it's uh, images and videos and simulations, uh, literature, and indeed uh, textbooks. So for me, when I started working with this stuff, <clears throat> I started, you know, in the, I think, most accessible entry point that lots of us start with, which is, wow, I didn't realize that the cost of books was having such a negative effect on my students' learning. And you move to OER and you learn about the permissions and you realize 
that access matters and you can think about access broadly and you can now think about access to knowledge creation and involving your students and thinking about scholarship and learning um, in a more active way and it brings you over to this world of open pedagogy. So I'm going to walk you through one of my early projects um, that I think is just a good example for what this can look like on the ground. Uh, this came from a class uh, where we were building the open anthology of earlier American literature that many of you may have heard about at this point. I feel like I talk about this slide all the time, but it's still such a great example that it's, um, it's worth going through. It's not popping up, Rajiv, are you clicking that? There we go. Um, and actually, you can just click through it because nobody needs these painful animations. But uh, what you're going to see if you look from the top left around the corner here is you'll see the Heath Anthology of American Literature that my students were purchasing for, I don't know, 90 or or $100 a pop. Um, and of course, the great irony, which all of our librarians are well aware of, is that the Heath Anthology contained literature from roughly 1400 to 18, 1860 or so, uh, which is pretty much all literature that was in the public domain. And my students were paying a hundred bucks to like, you know, buy this collection of public domain literature. So uh, I made a little Google spreadsheet there that you can just barely see and students signed up. And over the course of one summer, we, as a little team project, we built a replacement anthology out of public domain versions of the early American uh, canon. And of course, when the students started using this free textbook, uh, you know, at first they were thrilled because we saved $100, which for my students is a significant amount of money. Um, but after about a week or so, they were not so thrilled anymore because of course the anthology, which we were quite proud to have produced, uh, had lots of drawbacks, right? It didn't have maps, it didn't have explanations or introductions or glossaries or any of the explan explanatory ancillary pieces that would help them understand the, this literature, which was actually quite challenging. So we had this epiphany sort of as a class and realized that the students could create these ancillary, ancillary materials for the anthology as we went through the course. Um, you'll see there Hannah Hounsel wrote an introduction. Hannah works for me now. She's right on the other side of my wall. I'm so excited to see her there on my slide. Um, and uh, she wrote an intro to Christopher Columbus. You see Jonathan there. He did some videos. We dropped those and we started getting wicked psyched about all the stuff we could do with this anthology. I layered in an app called Hypothesis, which allowed students to annotate in the sidebar. Then I, of course, like all of us, stopped teaching the class, right? Because your schedule changes and you're like, man, I just started this project. But my colleague, Abby Good, forked that anthology and created a new version, uh, which was you know, 20 times better than anything we'd created with her students. Uh, and then it got picked up by the uh, Rebus organization, which is an ecosystem for OER publishing. And they are currently working on a really definitive volume uh, that came from my first version and a little bit from Abby's version and then a lot of academics. That's the next slide, uh, Rajiv. Um, and you'll see, if you click one more time, the, um, yep. uh, the of all direction, there we go. Yeah, so both of those, you'll see one more click to that. Those are the two table of contents. One is my original one that we did with the students. And the other one there is the Rebus one that's going to come out at the end of this year. Um, and they've just greatly expanded it, which is so exciting. This little seed of a project um, got the students so invested and involved in doing something that was a true contribution to the field of American literature even though they were all beginners in the field of American literature. And they didn't need to be anything but beginners to be able to contextualize and explain this literature to their peers um, and, and colleagues in the program. So it was a wonderful uh, project. I've now done this in many other classes, including classes that don't use public domain literature. So ask me how later, we could talk about it. Um, but I, I consider this to be kind of a really great example of an open pedagogy project. Um, so if we're thinking then about trying to take some of this practice and figure out like, what does this mean? Maybe our definitions might be. Uh, there's no definition you know, singular for open pedagogy. Um, and the best thing I think Rajiv and I can do is welcome you into the boisterous conversation that is uh, alive and well online as people sort of wrestle this out and, and enjoy thinking about it. Um, one of the sort of ways that I think about it is to kind of uh, take and push together the commitment to accessibility 
a commitment to uh, learner-driven relationships to education, and a commitment to connected learning. So let's take a look at what those might look like. Um, you might hear the phrase student-centered quite a bit, um, and in some ways I don't use it very much anymore just because it's become so like vapidly empty for a lot of us, because who doesn't teach in a student-centered institution? Nobody. Um, but I think about really giving that some teeth, and it's not so much about putting students at the very center as much as thinking about the learners in your class as contributors to the knowledge commons, um, people who are transforming the shape of, of knowledge and who are agents of their own learning. And it's actually why I tend to use the word learner rather than student, um, because a student is kind of just a, feels like a, a thing, right? It's very nouny. But that idea of learner, it has that verb built into it, right? It's somebody who is learning. It's a very active process. And I think we see that when we transfer over to um, a pedagogy that thinks about knowledge as constantly being created. And in that sense, we move a little bit from a focus on static content to a focus on a field that is in motion, which is, I would venture to say, 100% of our fields, right? Almost all of them. And remember, I'm an early Americanist, so I, I, my period has, is long past. But my field is still in motion for sure. And for students to really be part of that, they can't just absorb the static um, foundations of the field. That can be a part of what they do. But they also have to be welcomed into the learning community to participate, and that is a dialogic process where they both contribute and receive, and contribute and receive. So there's a bit of a, of a change mm -hmm. of emphasis there from content to community. I'm taking notes over here, I love it. I work with Robin so much, but I'm always learning from what she has to say. When you talk about contributing and receiving, I mean, this just reminds me of, um, uh, you think about the five R's, there's other R's as well. I mean, within the community, of course, there's reciprocity, and that's what you're pointing to as well. Uh, and that's one of the things this kind of approach enables. The other thing I love about this work is, is, is there's also rigor. I think there's a phrase from open source software development that talks about how given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. And I think that's one of the beauties of working in the open is it is kind of intimidating, but at the same time, it's incredibly liberating and it certainly strengthens the work when you put it out like this. Um, in many ways, this work, this approach reminds us of, of work, the writings of, of, of scholars past, um, including, of course, the incredible Paulo Freire, uh, Brazilian educator, philosopher, uh, who wrote about what he described as the banking concept of education, um, one in which students are really the depositories and the teachers are the depositors. And in this concept, uh, you know, education is simply the act of depositing. Um, and in this, I mean, in this last paragraph, I don't know if you can read this, I'll read out a bit. It has a lot that you could unpack, but the assumptions that go into the model that we, uh, that we um, perpetrate is what I would say, is that knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. I think it's, of course, there's, there's very interesting work around these lines, but I think if we think about our approach to the classroom, and especially in an increasingly precarious environment where we're dealing with incre increasingly precarious students, dealing with serious issues of food insecurity, student loan debt on the one hand, increasingly precarious faculty, which I'm never going to not talk about, uh, with the increasing rates of adjunctification, ca uh, contingent faculty given courses with two weeks to spare uh, in minimal support, uh, we're dealing with not just not the not the uh, professoriate, but the precariat. We have the precariat teaching the precarious, and so I think it's it's sometimes challenging to to point to things and and the need for moving away from this model when it's sometimes a survival mechanism. So as I raise this, in no way is this an indictment of faculty who themselves are, are under siege in many contexts in higher education. But I will point to the importance of open pedagogy as a way of really um, trying to reacquaint oneself with the purpose of why we got into higher education in the first place, what we're trying to achieve with our students, despite all of these distractions, despite all of these pressures. Uh, and I'm, I was delighted to see that in the Cape Town Plus 10 declaration, one of the directions that was identified as an area to move into, to expand on, to develop, uh, uh, 
uh, by the people who, who worked on that document was in fact open pedagogy. And I think one of the reasons for this is it allows us um, beyond the sort of surface level emphasis on, on OER and, and it really uh, beyond the surface le level emphasis of cost savings to going to what Robin talked about in terms of more learner-centered, learner-driven uh, approach to education. It really, I think, allows us to move away from what Freire is talking about or what he's describing, which is really classrooms of control and instead moving to what Robin's talking about, which is communities of possibility. And there's many ways in which we could do that, of course. We could talk about co-creating uh, course policies with our students uh, at the very least. Um, we could talk about moving away and, and discarding these ridiculous ableist policies that laptop bans would be a lovely example of that, which force students with certain disabilities to out themselves in the classroom, why they require the use of a laptop to take notes. Um, we could talk about, for example, uh, how we uh, utilize uh, things like the learning management system, um, which is quite fascinating, I think. How we, uh, you know, students where Audrey Waters has written beautifully about this, by the way, but how uh, we may build, you know, resources, activities, and at the end of a semester, we might archive that shell because we want to reuse some of that architecture in a future course offering. But the one thing we scrub from the LMS at the end of the semester is typically any trace of student activity. Again, it's sort of bizarre, the message that we're sending students. We do this with learning outcomes, and you can tell the benefits of learning outcomes, backwards course design and all of that wonderful stuff. Yes, good, excellent. But it's weird. It's weird that I can prescribe to my students, this is the direction of the journey. This is how your life is going to be different when you take this course with me. And I can tell you that before I've ever met you, because clearly you're not going to shape this journey. It's bewildering, these messages that we send our students. And then, of course, we can pick on assignments, uh, which uh, David Wiley has described variously as uh, disposable assignments. Um, I know that sounds a bit pejorative, but this is really pointing to the idea that typically students with, let's say, a traditional research essay, lab report, oral presentation, will work for hours on something. And typically, only one person ever sees their work. And the, the, the question is, you know, could we possibly achieve the same, if we're going to use that term, learning outcomes, um, while at the same time valuing student work, trying to actually serve the wider commons, serve their skill development, absolutely, but do a lot more than that in a way that allows them to experience learning in a more authentic fashion, that allows them to find a greater purpose and see value in what they're doing as not just another hurdle to jump over, another hoop to jump through in the course of acc accumulating additional credits. Uh, one of the organizations that has really pioneered this, of course, is the Wiki Education Foundation. And I love talking about Wikipedia because this is, I think, one of you know two dark corners of the internet for for academics. Uh, the first being ratemyprofessor.com, of course. And the, this is the second one, because this is like the 11th commandment of academia. Thou shalt not cite Wikipedia. It's essentially rubber stamped on every assignment guideline I've ever come across. It's bizarre, and it's also a ridiculous abdication of our responsibility when we know that this is the first port of call for our students. We know this is the first port of call for the public. And if we really want to be honest, and we should be, it is very often the first port of call for us who's in a better position to fix, to improve this public resource. There's a lot of research, a lot of people who've been doing Wikipedia assignments in partnership with the Wiki Education Foundation. They have step-by-step -step onboarding guides for students, for faculty, rubrics, case studies for different disciplines. Uh, and this is just in my discipline, a quick snapshot of some of the research that's looked at what kind of goals, what kind of outcomes can you achieve when students are editing Wikipedia instead of writing another research essay, for example. Of course, the lovely humbling fact that if a student of mine edits Wikipedia, thousands of people will read their work as opposed to typically, what is it, 10 people on average, if that, uh, that read a published uh, peer-reviewed article in a journal, an academic journal that's certainly not open access. Uh, and of course, you can go further. Imagine replacing an oral presentation with having students create brief instructional videos. These are stu two students at Simon Fraser University, uh, just across Barad Inlet over here in Vancouver. Um, they created this three minute video about the, the principles of persuasion, psychological theory. They submitted it. This video is openly licensed. It lives on YouTube right now. They won an international student video competition. So you can see recognition, monetary prize, and all of that. But the power of open pedagogy is that right now we have faculty in Malaysia, in Turkey, in Hawaii, using this video to teach the science of persuasion. And that's the beautiful power of open pedagogy right there. There's all kinds of creative ways to approach open pedagogy. 
I'm going to touch on open textbooks again briefly because I still hear uh, the complaint and sometimes it's really warranted uh, why faculty really need sometimes the crutch of ancillary resources, things like question banks. This is an open textbook that I helped adapt for the international context. Uh, and I knew when, when we did that work that I didn't have the ancillaries at the time. Uh, and I knew that there would be some of my colleagues who would not be able to adapt it or have the time to be able to write questions to go with it. Uh, because, of course, again, you talk about survival mechanisms, common practice is still, I'm afraid, assigning multiple choice, heavy question based exams, all drawn from publisher supplied question banks to students that are auto graded on some platform. And yeah, anyway, you, you're seeing Paolo Freire's model once again. Um, but the point is, we can do something more fun. Uh, and it occurred to me that it takes a much deeper level of understanding of a concept to be able to write three plausible distractors for a multiple choice question. And so I started with my small classes of 35 students uh, and they started by writing um, just one distractor. So substituting one distractor in a multiple choice question that I gave them. They did that for four questions. They peer reviewed uh, for uh, an additional set of eight questions. A couple of weeks later, they were swapping out two distractors, then three. And midway through the semester, they were writing the stem, they were writing the whole question, and the peer review and the scaffolding really helped. But my small classes of 35 students were then writing 1400 questions every semester, and this happened uh, back to back. So what I'm saying is, I will give you the question bank uh, that you desire at some point. I, it's not yet there, but it will be the polished question bank that faculty need. But in the, in the immediate term, it's really serving student learning, deeper learning at that. And then, of course, other forms of open pedagogy that surround the idea of OER. And these two dance together quite often. It's like a bit of a uh, extemporaneous, barely choreographed modern dance, really. Um, but what you're seeing over here is the work of undergraduate students at the Ohio State University uh, in environmental science, where they're writing bite-sized chunks. Uh, this volume is edited by the faculty in the program. So it's not just that students are capable of editing Wikipedia and writing work that will serve public understanding. It's not just that they will create instructional videos or that they're capable of doing that that will serve post-secondary students around the world. They can write the textbook. They're very, very capable of doing that. And the energy that they pour into this work when they realize it's not just another piece of paper that's going to end up uh, in someone's recycling box it makes a tremendous difference to the, to the uh, atmosphere in the classroom. And then finally, layering on the top, Robin talked about the use of hypothesis with the anthology of early American literature. Here's another way in which uh, we use this. Um, this is the same open textbook, by the way, in social psychology. And what you're seeing is a screenshot of how at the top, one of my students uh, has chosen to annotate publicly. Uh, and she is essentially sharing an experience from her own life that illustrates uh, a psychological phenomenon that's being discussed. She's augmenting the explanation in the text. We can peer review this and all of that. But the students are able to make what is a otherwise uh, straightforward learning resource into a much richer dynamic um, uh, resource for future cohorts of students. And at the bottom, another student sharing external resources uh, that um, that again illustrate the same idea, whether it's a video or something else. I certainly don't have to keep on top of what um, uh, cultural examples uh, my students might relate to this semester. Uh, Lord knows I encounter enough textbooks that still talk about 9-11 uh, uh, you know, for flashbulb memory, which is kind of useless uh, for many of my students today, uh, or, or hark back to some example from, from the 1990s. My students are in a much better position to, to do this than any textbook author ever could. And I just tossed this in really quick um, to give a shout out to the University System of New Hampshire because if you're working uh, on bringing open and open ped into your own institutions, you may feel sometimes like it's gonna never gain traction. Um, but we are just seeing such exciting things after seeding for two, three years. Um, we're really starting to see, and this is the uh, particularly biology and environmental science over at Keene, getting lots of notice for the citizen science um, and the open science initiatives that they've got going. It's almost seamlessly connected between their faculty doing research and their students. Um, so it's really a, a communal um, endeavor that reaches out into the region and they're doing super exciting things. And we're really seeing that all across our system now, but it did take a little while. So that's why I put that slide in there because it makes me so happy. 
And I'll follow that shout out with another shout out. And this is also connected to a future webinar in this series uh, from our wonderful colleagues at Montgomery College in Virginia, who have, I think, pioneered this idea as well of connecting the work of students in the classroom to much bigger goals. In this case, they have an open pedagogy fellowship that faculty can apply to. And they work with students to, to develop, to produce resources that serve a specific sustainable development goal from the United Nations. It's a wonderful work that I think is yet another example of how our community colleges are really leading the way. They are the pioneers. They are the champions. They know exactly where things are at. They rarely are championed in terms of being the heroes who are chronicled in the chronicle, but they are the ones who are really leading uh, the edge of this work. Um, and I may just uh, yep. throw in a plug right there that if you're interested in bringing a keynote or to your institution to talk about open, we have a really wonderful Google Doc of keynoters from community colleges who are prepared to do that. So just uh, hit me up and I'll share that link with you. Mm -hmm. And by sharing this little graphic, I don't just mean to, to highlight the wonderful illustrator, uh, Brian Mathers, or, or indeed the Audrey's writing on, on how we use the learning management system, but the broader notion of whether we think about our classrooms in this way or even the learning management system, uh, I think it is uh, worth asking this question, whether our students are surfing the open web, whether we're permitting that, whether we're enabling that, or whether we're simply uh, you know, creating this structure where they are ending up as serfs within a rather feudal uh, form of the web. Seems like a nice transition to the Alcatraz slide, um, <laughs> which I think, you know, if there's one thing I want to be famous for when I go to my grave, it's for comparing the learning management system to Alcatraz. Um, but really, the, the larger point there is that, you know, you put things into Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle or whatever, it's kind of hard to get stuff in and it's hard to get stuff out. And that's actually useful and good for a, a certain kinds of projects that we do with our students. But in terms of a larger architecture for education, particularly as Rajiv was talking about with the sort of importing your course for the next semester and deleting out all of your student work, um, I started thinking, what kind of architectures do we want to build if that's not the symbolic that we feel comfortable uh, sort of um, putting our, our, our power behind? And so I started thinking instead, what I'd really like to see us build are students would create for themselves something that felt like home. You know, we used to call it a home page, right? A, a home where you would have not shark infested waters around it, but driveways and pathways that would allow people to come in and collaborate with you, that would allow people to mentor you and help you improve your work. Um, and so that's the kind of ecosystem I started working on in our programs here. And this is where Domain of One's Own came in for us. Um, this is not probably the right program for everyone, but it certainly is an open pedagogy approach, I think. The suggestion here is that instead of locking students into a school-controlled site where their work is absolutely owned by the course, uh, symbolically, but also a lot of times they literally lose track of their work as it goes into the LMS and they, they don't have it at the end. Um, but instead to have the work live with them on a website that they create um, that reflects their own educational goals. Um, and we think of that in our program, not so much as e-portfolio, like here's my headshot and my CV and like a a perfect paper I once wrote, but instead as a port of call or a portal where you can really build the kind of web that is dialogic and interactive. And um, on this next slide, you'll see one of our students, Becca, talking about doing the kind of work that feels real. And we've understood this for so many years, right? Obviously, this is not new pedagogy, right? We've understood this and and We've talked about it every couple of years with a new word, high impact practice, applied learning, experiential learning. But the fact is that our students want to feel like the work that they're doing is real. So instead of creating things that look real, let's just do real work, right? And it actually makes it pedagogically simpler if you stop creating the hoops and instead look at the work that's relevant to the students and, um, and think about trying to achieve that. So for me, I kind of think about six domains in my teaching and three of them were domains that I think for 20 years in higher ed, I worked in all the time um, and felt really good about it. Those are 
the, the domain of knowledge, which is kind of, you know, you've, you went, maybe you got a PhD in a particular area, you've got content expertise, and you want to share that with your students, which is important. Um, but you also want your students to really understand that work. They don't just regurgitate it back to you in a rote way, but they can answer questions that are related, but not precisely the same. And maybe you even want your students to apply that work in some way to be able to thrive with that, with that knowledge. Um, and I think my courses were quite successful just in those three domains. But once I started to work in open, domains opened on either side of that that really surprised me. The first was the question of what my students needed in order to come to knowledge. So for me, when I realized the percentage of students that were too hungry to learn, you know, it, it, it makes the content of your discipline look secondary. So in order to get to that content, what do I need to do? This was everything from OER to opening a food pantry right outside my office door, partially just to remind myself that my students, in order to be learners, um, also have to have a lot of other needs accommodated. Um, but the most exciting thing for open pedagogy is the domains that open on the other side of that thriving or applied domain. It's that we also want our students to truly contribute to the world of knowledge, um, even if they're beginners, to understand that we value their voices and that the world needs their perspectives and we want to help them grow into their knowledge communities. Because ultimately we want them to be transforming their fields, um, to be transforming our world, and to be transforming the academy. I think um, the web that we inherit down the line higher ed that we inherit down the line, these things are going to be built by our students. So how can we prepare them to be engaged contributors and transformers as part of their educations? Oh, you're muted. There you go. Thank you. Uh, and, and this is one of the small efforts that Robin and I are trying to, to make to try to help this transformation of the academy. So it's a, it's a, it's a small contribution, but it's really a space for community. Um, we may you know, manage the site, but the Open Pedagogy note Notebook has a few purposes. One is if you're looking for a place to be able to browse through examples of Open Pedagogy in practice, hopefully in your discipline, uh, visit the Open Pedagogy Notebook and, and, and look through. Um, you'd often find ideas in adjacent or even entirely different disciplines that would not be normative practice within yours, but that are quite applicable. But the other is this is a space where we invite you to contribute. It doesn't have to be fully classroom tested uh, practices. It could be the stub of an idea that then the community will really uh, thank you for and then test and then refine and share back with the comments under that same philosophy of reciprocity. So we invite you to, to, to visit the, the notebook uh, and to contribute it, uh, contribute to, to it as well. And for people who are, I think, working within open education or even who are new to OER, um, maybe a, as just a, a, a sort of a, an ending note, I, I do want to caution people. I think some people feel as though, uh, you know, they want, want to get a handle on open textbooks and OER before they start dabbling with open pedagogy. And I don't think that is necessarily something one needs to do. Uh, in, in some ways, I think this is similar to, this notion is similar to the idea of a sort of Maslowian hierarchy where we need to take care of some needs before we get to self-actualization. Uh, but in fact, I think this is an area where, where we can really start um, and serve our students without having to worry. You don't have to do OER before you do open pedagogy. And in fact, you don't even need OER in many cases to, uh, to, to perform open pedagogy. Um, I think it's really about uh, embracing what the deeper values of openness are uh, in terms of, uh, as, as Robin said, it's an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education. Uh, we're hopeful that this provided a bit of an introduction. There's a lot more conversations that we could have, especially those uh, that uh, fall along, typically along the margins, the more critical conversations that I think Robin and I are very eager to have. Uh, but I think that at this point, we've been drawing on enough that uh, we're hoping we can turn things over to the rest of you and really have a, a bit of a discussion. So happy to take questions, uh, receive comments, and otherwise uh, help uh, in any other way we can. And now somebody is going to come in and tell us what is to be done. Because I know people have been monitoring the chat, so I think mm -hmm. someone's going to pop on and, uh, but we can't hear you, person. There we go. Hey, it's Chris. So um, 
there were mostly comments, but the first question, um, Mary Stevens uh, asked a bunch of questions about sort of um, logistical questions, it seems like, about what to do, for example, about sites that are taken down. Uh, some material would need to be replaced frequently. Uh, and then there's another question about how do you handle multiple sections of the same course? Uh, I don't know if you're able to see it. It's 1247 is when she posted it. And the third question was, uh, do, you, do you do the same project, sort of creating online test textbooks every semester with new students? So multiple questions there. Um, I'll start uh, sure. with the last question um, because I'm not totally sure I follow the other ones, although I, I think I could, you know, I can always make something up. But anyway, uh, for the last question about, uh, it, it was funny because sometimes people ask me with like the open anthologies, which I do in a lot of classes now, um, co-creating open textbooks with students, people say, gosh, doesn't that kind of stink for like the next guys because the first people got to write the textbook and what do they do? Obviously, you're not going to throw it out and start over. And it's actually kind of stinks for the first people because I don't know that it's all that fun to like scrape the web for the stuff that you need and like just do the, okay, somebody's got to write the section on blah, right? The, the nitty gritty. What really became fun for us when we were co-creating textbooks were, was in future iterations of the course when students could start um, shaping and repackaging the stuff around new themes, adding new materials in the margins. But think about it this way, with the open anthology of early American literature, you can create a whole new anthology on race and freedom in American literature. You can use all of the same texts, but you can write all new introductions. It's kind of a different way, in fact, of writing a research paper in a lot of ways. So we realized that once you have the, the basics of the foundation of the content, that's when it really gets fun for students to add in additional things and reshape those textbooks. So I found it, got, it actually gets better and better every semester when you're doing that kind of work with, with students. Yeah, and I'll try and pick up on the uh, the first few questions as well. Thanks for those questions, Mary. Um, I think there's issues that you're glancing at that I think are worth talking about over here. The deeper issues. So when you when you talk about sites that are taken down, to me this is this is highlighting the problem of working with, for example, and especially tying our students and their work to proprietary platforms and technologies. This is why I think so many people practicing open pedagogy uh, try to rely on community-owned open infrastructure and open ed tech resources. Um, because I think if we're, if we're able to host it at the university, if we're able to work with organizations like Wikipedia, uh, especially where there's an archiving, that's typically less of an issue. Uh, but certainly even if you're doing domain of one's own in WordPress, uh, you do have the ability to, to archive and then of course restore under, uh, on open source platforms as well. Um, the second question about handling multiple sections, I think is really also an interesting uh, pedagogical question. I think there's no right answer, but of course I think I've seen successful approaches in different ways. I've seen cases of where you take the same resource and you essentially clone it because you can, especially with an open ed resource in a, in a platform like Pressbooks, for example, and have different cohorts of students work on it in parallel, uh, work on different versions of it separately. But I think there's real power in being able to run courses as open boundary courses. Uh, so have supporting students within your classroom as much uh, in the best ways you can, but allowing them to interact with those outside of those walls of those classroom meetings. Uh, I think moving to an, another section uh, is not a terribly difficult way to, to extend oneself, but I like to see it even go even further, of course, where even informal learners on the open web are able to interact with uh, students who are taking your course, for example. Uh, but I think it's really, it's really up to you. Um, I think there's ways in which you could harness different students, different classes working on the same resource, the open, same open pedagogy project that allows you to bring in elements of pure uh, assessment. Um, there's a wonderfully interesting uh, research literature on pure assessment that shows that the most of the benefits seem to come more from students editing another student's work than, uh, than from receiving feedback. And so I think opportunities for them to edit and, and, and look at a student's work who they don't have an opportunity to usually uh, are quite helpful. And I'm, I'm just going to jump in real quick uh, to respond to Lee because I happen to see one thing in the chat uh, as it's all flying by um, about talking about when I say you can do this with non-public domain literature. Um, yeah, so I've done this in a first year seminar and I've done this for our interdisciplinary studies program. So for example, our, my students are in the middle of a three-year build of a textbook called 
interdisciplinary studies, a connected learning approach. And in the first semester of the build, we used a commercial textbook and I lectured a lot. You know, we looked at the content. Most content in foundational textbooks is not proprietary because if it was, it wouldn't be in the foundation of an, of an introductory textbook. Um, what's proprietary is the particular infographic they create or the glossary they make or the language they use. And a lot of times that stuff kind of sucks. Like the students do not like it, right? They, they're very rarely like, oh my God, this textbook is the most fun book I ever read. So if you teach the proprietary knowledge, and let them recast that in their own student voice. Any introductory textbook that you're currently using can be rewritten by students. And you know what? I'm all for getting the OpenStax intro to bio, but you know what? I bet an intro to bio that your students wrote over a few years and honed would be more engaging for them and in some ways um, help students learn more effectively. That's been my experience. When we did it in a first year seminar, we actually wrote a textbook on student retention and success in college. The students wrote that textbook, right? It's way, it's going to be way better. Um, it had all the data, it had all research, right? But it was from a, a student perspective. So I think there's lots of ways to use that model. But if you teach introductory physics, your students can absolutely write an introductory physics textbook. But better yet, they don't really have to. You can borrow stuff from the open textbooks that are out there in physics, and then your students can work around some of that harder stuff that's already taken care of for them. So the question right after that is what process have you gone through to get students permission to share their creations with the public uh, to comply with FERPA? Yes, I used to have an acronym for FERPA. It was like faculty who just don't want to change the way they work. You know, I can't remember what it, what it stood for. But um, yeah, so, you know, you got to be smart about FERPA. Like, I don't put my students' grades on the web, and I'm like, hey, it's open, right? Um, but the, the whole point of open pedagogy is that our students are agents of their mm -hmm. own education. For me, that means spending a significant amount of time with students before we go onto the web, talking about the challenges of working on the web, including some of the ways that the web is going to um, exploit their work, uh, mm -hmm. pre present risk for them. And occasionally, some of my students choose not to work on the open web, and I consider that an absolute win for open pedagogy. They stay in the LMS. I actually had a student who was like, I like my three ring binder. Now, for me, I don't allow that unless you make an educated um, argument about why you're making these choices about technology as they relate to your goals. And he was certainly able to do that. Um, so I have a lot of preparation in the front end where we read about the benefits of working open and also the risks and challenges of working in public. Um, but once we do that, my students all work on their own domains and they choose their own licenses. So if they choose to copyright and not openly license their site, they can do all sorts of awesome work, but we do not pull that work into our textbooks. Um, they know that if they wanna be curated into our class textbooks, then they have to work with the CC BY license, which is the license we choose to use for our materials. Um, so uh, you know, once in a while, we'll have a student who you know, chooses a chooses just copyright without an open license. And again, fantastic, right? I mean, it's, it's great for students to understand um, what options are out there for them. And if I have kind of a 98% sharing rate, like I'm pretty good with that. There's also some good reasons why students don't wanna be public on the web related to safety and um, all sorts of things that you, sh you, know, you should not just march in. Um, Blindly, I think both Rajiv and I are not proselytizers for the open web. We're proselytizers for a just and equitable learning ecosystem and proselytizers for making, for shifting the web to a more democratic environment. Um, but these are not things you do by making a decision, right? They, these are processes that you engage in um, and there's more risk for some people than others in, in doing that work. Very much so. Sorry, um, Chris, do you mind if I just add a little bit to no, that? Question? Go ahead. It's just about one o'clock. I don't want to take yep. any more of your time than we than you have. <laughs> 
Well, I'll just uh, finish uh, to augment uh, uh, Robin's answer to that same question. Um, I think she sits, for me, obviously, unsurprisingly, hitting the nail on the head. Uh, there are tangible things we could point to. I mean, the Rebus Guide for, for creating open textbooks with students has a sample MOU for working with your students. The Montgomery College for the Open Pedagogy Fellowship has a, a, a draft sort of agreement that they have. So you can use these as models. So even in Canada, we have uh, privacy guidelines. But for me, I think it's really interesting that these questions come up when we're talking about open pedagogy, when these are really conversations that should be happening in any classroom, even if you're not doing anything remotely related to open pedagogy. These are skills, literacies that need to be developed in conversations that need to be had as students uh, uh, move through their education, I think. So I'm really glad to have those conversations. Um, if we're going to serve students, I think we do have to serve them well. And so uh, again, uh, informed uh, uh, choices, uh, making that possible, making them aware of the implications of their work, uh, specific strategies, working with the learn within the learning management system, uh, even with something like Wikipedia, you can do that until it reaches a certain threshold um, as uh, as even, and for the student for the to be comfortable for their work to go public. Um, they may choose for it not to, that's fine. They may choose for it to, uh, to be public, but not linked with their identity, that's fine. There's a range of choices. Uh, and I think making sure that those choices are, are informed and then enabled is, is really key. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's probably all I'll add uh, to that for now. But I think the fact that you, I mean, I'm glad that this question is being asked. It is a critical question. Um, I would like that question to be asked a lot more uh, with other elements of student training, including, for example, when we um, uh, assign uh, not just access codes, but platforms, uh, uh, commercial proprietary platforms that in fact scrape and monetize student data. Uh, we should be having those conversations even and, and perhaps especially under those circumstances uh, and not, uh, not indeed just with open pedagogy. There's one more question if you all, you both would just, I think it relates that I think I'd like to hear your opinion on, on it. Um, and someone asked about uh, student co-creation. How can we make sure they are compensated and that their work is valued? Particularly given the challenges to, to many students simply surviving that Robin points out, I've grappled with this. Yeah, so when we did the open anthology, I did it over a summer and my students were not enrolled in a class with me and so they were not compensated. So I, I paid them, um, you know, cash out of my pocket because no one had heard of open education back then. Now you can get grants, right? Um, and your, your institutions will have some seed money. But in general, one of the reasons I like doing this in a class is, you know, I come from an institution, we have a four, four teaching load, um, very high load. Many people teaching in community colleges have Last one I was working with, they had a five-five-two teaching load. Um, this is academic labor to create open resources. So even though they're free to use, they're not free to produce. And that mm -hmm. means acknowledging the student labor and acknowledging um, faculty labor. One of the benefits of doing it in a course is that it can become part of the pedagogical sort of payback of the course. So I don't pay my students cash when it's their assignment, you know, to be working on an introduction about Christopher Columbus and they feel great about that. Um, it also becomes more a part of my prep and my teaching so that I, I also feel um, that I can fit it into my very busy workload. Um, other than that, I would say uh, it's really important if you're working on an open initiative, maybe particularly with your faculty and particularly with contingent faculty who are doing the lion's share of teaching, um, particularly in the United States, uh, if you are working with people and asking them to innovate in these ways to realize that they need to be compensated for the extra time that that takes and the pedagogical innovation uh, also takes time. The payback on retention, um, the, the data that we have for how this serves students is growing every day um, and the investments you have that institutions have to make are very modest. Um, but, but I would say not to do it uh, without making sure that we're not further exploiting um, mm -hmm people's good goodwill. I agree and I think uh, for students I'm glad this is being raised about students but uh, as Robin says it's especially for non-regular as we say or, or contingent or adjunct faculty as well. I think if we in some sense reserve the creation of OER, publishing of open textbooks even, for those who are privileged enough to be able to say I'm going to forego compensation for this intellectual work. Um, or at least be severely undercompensated for for that for that for that academic labor. We're really reserving the privilege of OER 
uh, for people uh, with certain backgrounds, certain ideologies. And in, in an odd way, uh, the same tool that could be used to really dismantle or challenge uh, existing power hi hierarchies is being used to reinforce and erect those same hierarchies. So I think we have to be careful about this. Um, if the ideology of privilege is then overrepresented in the text of the OER itself as a result of this kind of practice. So I think it's an excellent question. Um, there's different different approaches, I think. Uh, one is, again, the, the oddness of this, uh, this question being raised uh, with open pedagogy, even though I love the question. Uh, because of course, with regular, let's say, disposable traditional assignments, let alone compensation, there's no recognition and there's no motivation or little motivation uh, for students. So I'm glad to see progress in those areas. But yes, um, I think, uh, things like open pedagogy fellowships. Um, certainly at my institution, we do something similar where if faculty are working with students, even if it's a you know, development by faculty and it's focus group with students or they're co-creating resources, being able to give them honoraria uh, beyond the recognition is is ideal. And then of course, the opportunity to spin out business models from that. Um, another useful resource, is the book that was published maybe two years ago, Made with Creative Commons, uh, an example of how, in some cases, you can openly license intellectual property and really uh, uh, allow for it to have maximum impact because uh, it's available freely in, uh, uh, in digital formats. But then of course, being able to monetize things like print formats, if you're, depending on what you're talking about. It could be print uh, copies of anthologies. It could be uh, uh, other sorts of tangible resources uh, or other services that are built around those. Uh, but I think it's an excellent question and I would love to see better models for being able to uh, recognize the efforts of students. Uh, so Certainly, with the best of intentions, I think the open education movement is capable of perpetrating real harm. And one of the ways it, it, it could do that uh, is if it uh, ignores uh, these questions of um, equity and, and not just, if we're going to talk about equitable access to knowledge creation, we need to make sure that it truly is equitable. Um, so I'm glad that, that, uh, that this is a yet another forum where this question has been raised. And, and those uh, people, I mean, we're talking about SUNY over here, uh, are, are in a really good position perhaps to explore uh, and develop new models, better models, to be able to um, recognize um, the, the academic labor, especially by students. Great. That was actually a, a great ending comment. So we will take that back to the faculty um, council on teaching and technology. And I think that's something that we can grapple with going forward. Um, so I want to thank you so much to Robin and Rajiv for your time, for your wisdom, and for your motivation um, today. This was really wonderful. Uh, and thank you to everybody who attended. We hope to see you on future webinars. I did put in the chat that this uh, recording will be available on the webinar schedule site. So please click on it there as Robin said you can follow her on Twitter and get links to the uh, slides immediately it'll also be under the open pedagogy hashtag and so uh, again thanks to everybody and we will see you next time